Aloha kako. My name is Bernadette Gonzalez. I'm a professor of American Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And aloha everyone. My name is Hokulani Aiko, and I am tuning in from my home that is on Lakwangan territory in what we now call Victoria, an island way up north in the Pacific. It's good to be here with y'all today. So thank you for having us. We want to thank the Hawaii Book and Music Festival for um, inviting us to share our work on Detours, a Decolonial Guide to Hawaii. Um, we do have some slides to share, so I'll go ahead and share those now. Um, and I also want to emphasize that um, uh, we, we, will, we should have time for questions at the end, so go ahead and put those in the Q&A and in the chat so um, we can get a hold of them at the end of our presentation today. So we're gonna get started. Um, right away. So um, before the pandemic, tourists visiting Hawaii vastly outnumbered local residents by more than nine and a half million to one and a half million. The fourth smallest state, Hawaii ranks 10th in visitors or did. Uh, tourism along with militarism is Hawaii's most dominant economic engine, cementing tourist desire and satisfaction as the definitive concerns that shape the health of Hawaii. Well, it provides over $15 billion in visitor expenditures that supports hundreds of thousands of residents whose livelihood depends on tourism. Tourism as an economy and set of practices also operates to smooth over the continued impact of racism, sexism, and colonialism. Hawaii is produced as a holiday destination for and by tourism a place unique for its combination of tropical climate, exotic geographies, multiculture, and indigenous culture and history, accompanied by the comfort to which tourists have become accustomed. Overdetermined as a tropical paradise, Hawaii's present day struggles with colonialism, military occupation, native Hawaiian dispossession, food sovereignty, environmental degradation, and problems of sustainability are elided by its representation in and as an exotic postcard image. Guidebooks, travel narratives, and fiction constitute the bulk of this fantasy island narrative. Today, guidebooks are the most popular genre of writing depicting the islands. Let's see. Is. Um, they offer up Hawaii for easy consumption, tantalizing reveal, tantalizingly reveals the secrets, orient a particular relationship to the islands, and suggest the most efficient way to make the most of a holiday. If you come to Hawaii as a visitor, you've probably read or bought one. And the Detours Project takes seriously the power of form and the reading practices, imaginaries, and publics produced by these texts. Their power to manifest the fantasies of the exotic into actual places and island destinations for the collective consumption of tourists. The Detours Project takes the guidebook form and deliberately perverts it to offer alternative narratives, tours, itineraries, mappings, and images of Hawaii. The project initially began at an American Studies Association conference two or three years ago now. Oh my goodness. It, it's you know, time. It must be more than that, right? Because it's been like, it was two years ago that the book was yeah. published five years ago. And so maybe, yes, time flies when you're in pandemic. And at this conference, we, you know, attended all of these panels with colleagues of ours um, at UH Manoa and elsewhere. And we heard person after person talking about their work. We realized that there was a critical mass of scholars and scholarship of the kind of, the kind of place-based work that was reca recasting Hawaii consistently away from its tourist fantasy and for some not engaging with it at all. As the project took shape, we asked ourselves, how would one write about Hawaii and the different sites and practices we wanted to highlight without falling into the same trap as the guidebook? And so three questions really guide this project. Given how Hawaii's value is measured by tourism, how might we offer a decolonial encounter with Hawaii as something worth understanding and engaging in? Second, how does the complex history of Hawaii as a sovereign indigenous place guide the project's intervention? In particular, its decolonial vision. And then third, finally, how do we balance writing about place in loving detail and aloha 
without making it an open invitation or making clear that there is a protocol for engaging or not engaging with certain places depending on one's positionality. How do we do all of that? So these questions are, of course, not new. Um, as feminist scholars of empire, we share intellectual genealogies informed by the important work of Haunani K. Trask, who has famously disinvited tourists to Hawaii. To paraphrase her, if you want to help in the struggle for decolonize, decol decolonization, don't come. Similarly, Jamaica Kincaid, in writing about Antigua in a small place, addresses the tourist in direct fashion with a purpose of alienating him and making clear how his desires impact the land and its residents. Her address to the tourist, quote, you needn't let that slightly funny feeling you have from time to time about ex exploitation, oppression, domination, develop into full-fledged unease or discomfort. It could ruin your holiday, unquote. At the same time, we see also how tourism has made itself indispensable to and inextricable from the lives of the people who live in these small places. Many don't have the luxury of rejecting what tourism has to offer. And this way we draw from the critical eye of the late Teresia Teava, who's thinking through of how militarism is embedded, embedded in the lives of Fijians and other Pacific Islanders, lovingly understands how these economic structures have become a means for survival and how they can be just as powerfully recruited into native and indigenous agendas that, be, that can be decolonizing. Detours works within the tensions identified by these scholars and activists. Um, and as we work closely with our contributors, they ask similar questions and push back on the project. We all became interested in a genre, a different kind of genre that would not lay out Hawaii for consumption and access, but rather illuminate and archive the specifically decolonial vision and mission that was the spirit and driving force propelling the work. So while it started off as a guidebook, it evolved into a guide to decolonization. It takes on some of the conceits of the guidebook, but decenters the tourist gaze, reorienting relationships to place according to what contributes to, to um, a consciousness and the broader work of decolonization. Indeed, while we initially saw tourists as the first audience for this project, we've come to center residents of Hawaii, native and non-native alike, who as a result of settler colonialism and our assimilationist educational system may not themselves know the indigenous histories under the concrete and steel of tourism and development. As the project evolved, the question of how one could write about Hawaii differently and decolonially expanded into to include questions of language and translation, as well as what could and what should be written about and also what could and should be left out. With regards to language, one thing we liked about, guide, about guidebooks is the accessible level of prose. We asked our contributors to aim for a general audience while balancing this request with also pushing our readers to learn certain terms like decolonial, settler colonialism, which are needed to name how power works in this context. Later in the process, the question of how to write also became one of using, translating, of using and translating Hawaiian terms. For some pieces, this worked, and for others whose writers pushed back, it didn't. As editors, Bernadette and I, um, it was a learning moment for us, and it pushed us to include a note on translation in the, interject, in the introduction, and also to include a brief glossary. With regard to content, what, sh what should a guidebook or guide include? Given that the guidebook relies on a promise of, of ultimate access, our contributors and we wanted to clarify that writing about a place was not necessarily an open invitation. Some were specific about the things they would write about and the things they did not. Others laid out protocol for visitation or involvement or non-involvement. The eventual framing of ideas of the guide versus guide, okay. The eventual framing ideas of the guide versus guide book and individual pieces themselves thus highlight the kinds of protocols of access and knowledge that we wanted to balance. Detours offers an alternative encounter with place through a range of storytelling that is tied to place-based responsibility. Its ultimate vision is to contribute to a broader decolonial movement in Hawaii. 
So our goals for the book are twofold. So the first is that we sought to interrupt tourism's hold on the narratives about Hawaii and provide alternative viewpoints and approaches that allow for a deeper understanding of what lies beneath the facade of paradise. Second, the essays, personal reflection, art, and maps that make up detours provide examples of how activists, academics, and community members are working to radically disrupt these frames to restore and nurture Ea what Noalani Goodyear Kaupua has described as sovereignty, life, breath that requires constant action. Although the book was initially inspired by the guidebook genre, its evolution as a guide to decolonization instead invites the reader to understand Hawaii outside of that tourist gaze and participate in tours or activities that unsettle for one mass tourism. In its curation of stories about place and relationship of accountability to place, it actively contributes to and illuminates part of a broad and multifaceted effort toward decolonizing Hawaii. Many of the contributors are involved in active efforts towards social justice, reparation, and historical responsibility. Unlike the guidebook whose audience is the tourist or visitor looking to consume Hawaii, we seek the kinds of readers that are looking to be transformed. Those who are seeking examples of how real people can disrupt and transform dominant ways of encountering and apprehending Hawaii. So in sum, this is a guide that considers the different ways that communities and other groups work together toward restoring Ea, the breath and sovereignty of the Lahui, Aina, and its people. The Lahui Hawaii has tactically, strategically, and persistently resisted dismemberment and military occupation the stories, poetry, and art gathered in this book include concrete examples of how we move from metaphors of decolonization to material practices and everyday acts of resurgence that bring about real change in the lives of people, transforming our relationships with land as Aina so it can better feed us again. And here I'm gonna read extensively, extensively from our introduction in the book. While this is a guide, it should not be construed as a blanket invitation. Not everyone who reads this book will be invited or allowed to go to all of the places that are described. There are places and knowledge that have been left out altogether because they are not meant for outsiders. We honor the wishes of the community who have asked that this book not be an open invitation to visitors. We ask that you respect their wishes and follow their protocol for how to engage or not. Sometimes the best way to support decolonization and Kanaka OEV resurgence is to not come as a tourist to our home. The hour in this sentence recognizes that Kanaka and Kanaka call this place home and that we all need to relearn how to live here in radically different ways if the Aina and Vai land and water are going to be able to promote, to support Ho'e people, human beings, into the future. Thus, an important underlying assumption of this book is that not all knowledge, information, or access to places is open and available to everyone. We understand that within a touristic framework, this is radically audacious, but we ask the reader to proceed with caution and restraint. We also recognize that this uninvitation might be disconcerting, and it should be. Hawaii, as ideal tourist destination made possible by an infrastructure built for and around visitors' comfort, safety, and pleasure. That infrastructure and the ideas, values, decisions that support it were and are built on historical and present day dispossession of Kanaka Oivi. Unless we actively work to dismantle this infrastructure and refuse the tourist imaginary, we will, we will wittingly or unwittingly contribute to reproducing the occupation and colonization of these places, people, and practices. We ask readers to contribute to preparing for a different future. If this knowledge at all makes them uneasy, and if they want to approach and engage Hawaii differently with a sense of Pono and Kuleana, then we invite them to join with us on this huokai, this transformative journey. Instead of looking at what Hawaii can offer the reader, and it has much to offer beyond sun and sand. We ask you to think instead of what you can learn from and contribute to ongoing efforts towards sustaining AI. So we want to highlight two terms that capture the tensions of this book, aloha 
a term whose meaning incorporates notions of compassion, regard, fondness, among many other sentiments for mutual affection and reciprocity, and aole, which means no, never, no. We draw your attention to these terms because they remind us that we must take heed and proceed with caution. Aloha is the Kanaka Uibi term most identified with the tourism industry. As noted above, the tourism industry uses the term aloha to represent market and promote Hawaii and Native Hawaiians as naturally hospitable and welcoming. Such representations have contributed to how colonial powers, the United States foremost among them, have translated this to mean an unconditional open door. In the collection, a beautiful poetic essay by Nau Revilla and Heoli Osorio titled Aloha is Deoccupied Love provides a deeper, infinitely nuanced and more profound engagement with this term, establishing it as a radical action infused word. Quote, our aloha is born from the power of creation as established in our mo'olelo, unquote. Delinking aloha from its perversion as a tourist greeting, Revilla and Osorio instead insist in its power in generative and honest interactions made possible when, quote, we share things with others in sustainable ways, unquote, and through relations that require reciprocity and responsibility. As they put it, quote, while the word is a common expression in Hawaii, particularly in greetings, it is important to remember that aloha is not tourist oriented. The practice does not exist for consumption, purchase, or display. Aloha cannot be owned like property, like a souvenir, unquote. Identifying aloha as the power that fuels the occupied love, it moves from touristic commodity to generative force of revolution. This in, in, indeed is leagues away from aloha as inferred consent for occupation or an open invitation. Aole is a demand that has not been as equally heard. <laughs> it too has been uttered with the earliest instances of overreach and overstaying in this place. In Wahikea Maile's account of the tradition of refusal from before the overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani by sugar oligarchs backed by the US military to the Kue petitions voicing resistance to US annexation to the more recent 2014 Department of Interior hearings and federal recognition and of course, Aole TMT, Aole is a familiar refrain. Structuring his essay around the mountain of Aole testimony from Native Hawaiians and allies that met DOI representatives during their various pub public hearings, Miley quotes testimony after testimony. Quote, your answer from me is no. You cannot give me back something I never gave up. Take your thing you wanna give us, throw them in the trash, we don't want it. We sovereign, unquote. So as we moved away from the guidebook, we also thought about the organization of the book differently. At first, we found the value of the guidebook, but guidebook books differentiation of Hawaii by islands useful. But then we quickly moved away from that and came up with a thematic organization for the table of contents. That and while we've organized them according to these different themes. Um, we also recognize that there was some overlap and some of these, some of the pieces could be located in multiple places, but the, or, but the, um, yeah, so the table of contents really begins with place and then moves from there. First, we have uh, part one is Vahipana, Vahipana storied places, and it lingers on a number of places whose histories have been forgotten, buried, or misrepresented. Tourism and its sibling development have had a lot to do with how the deep histories of these sites have faded from contemporary view or from memory or re-narrated re only in terms of tourist access and consumption. So in Hawaii, Vahipana is the term used to designate a place as sacred or legendary. There are a number of pieces that coalesced around genealogical stories of place, love letters or elegies in written and visual form. And for this section, we want to highlight several pieces of place-based storytelling that drive home how even the notion of place and directionality are always under duress in Hawaii and how indigenous acts of remembering place and passing that knowledge on are part of a larger decolonial strategy. So the first, um, which is Kapolani Landgraf series Puno Ibi, um, presents a series of manipulated photographs of places on Maui. 
Kapolani draws our attention to Ke One Hanau and Ke Kula Iwi, the birth sands and burial sites of generations of OEV ancestors that have been desecrated by the construction industry on both Maui and Oahu. In her artist statement, Kapolani outlines the history of sand extraction for construction, describing how this process essentially mined the beaches of the islands in order to build roads, buildings, and bases. In, um, sorry, uh, in this image, text describing the location of a heiau that was located at the base of the pu'u um, borders the open wound of the land that has been excavated, encircling the violence that ripped it apart with a chant of memory. Here's another image. Kapolani clarifies the double violence at work in this moment, leaving no border between the land and the ibi. She says, Native Hawaiians buried the ibi, the bones of their ancestors, within the sand dunes throughout Hawaii. They believed the mana of the person lived in the bones, ola na ibi, the bones live. At Hono Kahua, Maui, in 1989, over a thousand Native Hawaiian remains were removed to build the Ritz Carlton Kapalua Resort. So despite the 1990 law uh, protecting burial sites, uh, Kapolani states that there is continued pressure to develop Hawaiian Aina and Hawaiian Iwi are constantly threatened. She asks, Navai e ho'ola i na Iwi, who will protect our bones? So in these decidedly not exotic and lush landscape images, Kapolani uses text to show the incursions and violence upon the land, which renders it into base material for extraction under a capitalist regime, rather than as Aina, as ancestor and living kin. So in her, in the Vahipana section, um, orientation to place, directionality and positionality are also structuring themes. The piece that begins the section is Kamana Beamer's um, essay, whose humorous story about giving tourist directions to Kona Airport opens when tourists ask him directions to the airport. He replies, about 20 ahupua'a to the south. And in that answer, he drives home an indigenous system of Palena place boundaries and establishes, quote, a more intimate knowledge of Hawaiian geography and place that is built on relationality rather than ownership. And in her poem, Waikiki on Google Maps Satellite View, Brandy Nalani McDougall contrast, contrasts Google's cartography of Ili'i with indigenous memory. The first stanza shows how Ali'i have been reduced to street names. In Waikiki, Lili'i Okulani is just a few blocks from the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center and runs Mauka from Kalakaua to the Alawai. Kuhio meets with her amidst vacation condos. Here, Ali'i names designate shopping and lodging in Waikiki's tourist jungle. The last sta sta stanza is a point poignant reminder of what remains and what remains to be taken back. Search the, brand, search the brown canal water that once fed the marshes for any part of us that is still ours. Whatever remains after even the names of our kings and queens have been taken left roaming the streets. McDougall's intentions for this poem, po uh, for, for these poems, quote, to have the mo'olelo of this, these places made more visible, even when they are only a hint at a deeper history and meaning, to highlight the tensions arising from using both mapping technologies and to draw attention to the ways using Google Map, Maps aligns its users with colonial thinking and realities. Her intention is to, un to unsettle the universality of knowledge and access that these new technologies promise which run counter to indigenous relationships to land, which are evident in our mo'olalo. Uh, part two, Hanalima, Decolonial Practices, explores practices that restore or establish people's connections to places and the practices that are connected to that place. Hanalima, which means working with hands, singles out the importance of putting muscle power behind the work of creating new visions and kipukas or oases of decolonial life. 
For us, Hanalima is also the labor of restoring, reestablishing, and reaffirming the relationship between people and places through actions based on aloha aina. These include community-based and place-based efforts around the revival of cultural practices and ongoing struggles against and alongside tourism as a dominant economic engine of the island. So in a decolonial context, we note the craft, the skill, the effort that are marshaled on many fronts to generate a new imagination of and future for Hawaii, to make space and defend OEV sovereignty, to restore and invigorate cultural practices and knowledge, and to mobilize the people of Hawaii, native and non-native alike, in working towards sovereignty. The work of decolonizing requires labor of the mind, the heart, and the hands. So in Karen Kosasa and Stan Tomita's Settler Colonial Postcards, um, uh, these are particularly apt for the Detours project. Karen and Stan have produced and expanded on an original set of postcards uh, that they displayed in Buffalo, New York in 2001, adding one more to create what they call a didactic detour project that poses the question, whose paradise in various ways. Um, this suite of postcards focuses on jarring, jarring contradictions that unsettle Hawaii's image of paradise, juxtaposing scenes of Hawaii with unorthodox postcard explanatory text. This, postcard, uh, this pedagogical project, what they call the pedagogical project, um, parallels the larger project of the book, but takes a form that has overwhelmingly contributed to a particular image of Hawaii and turning it on its head and demanding more from it. Um, as Karen and Stan put it, didactic art is never considered good art. It's too akin to, <laughs> but what's exactly, but that's exactly what they actually wanted to produce from this project. Little room for interpretation, given the little room this history is permitted in the history books. So in this postcard, um, the text on the back of, uh, I think this one is called Ali, Ali Iolani Hale, Scene of a Crime, 1893 Overthrow. Um, the text provides the ugly history of overthrow that is often smoothed over in tourist material. So the front feature is the building where the Hawaii Supreme Court is housed while the questions on the back ask, can an American judicial system ethically function within a colonized or occupied country? How is this possible? Whose paradise mm -hmm. is this? Um, and so there's a little arrow in the front that you see um, and that's Karen and Stan's way of pointing to how the, this history of the overthrow is hidden on a tiny, tiny panel in the back of the building. Um, and that's what you know, they wanted to, to point um, the, the, atten the viewer's attention to. So in other words, these are postcards that would never sell at the local ABC stores. Mm -hmm. um, but they do the work of unsettling notions of paradise that tourists and some residents hold to be true. Um, by inserting the history of US empire into the visual lexicon of tourism, Karen and Stan's suite of postcards do the work of decolonial refusal, turning the postcard into a text for unsettling provocations. So alongside the work of countering representations of the island, in Honolima, we also look at other kinds of labor, particularly the hand with the hands and the heart including community-based, place-based, Aina-based efforts around the revival of cultural practices. Kalani Ua, Riri, Hanohano Naehu, Noilani Gudir Kaupua, and Julie Warwick's collaborative piece on the Keava, Keava Nui fish pond on Molokai um, documents one of the first community-driven efforts from the 1980s to restore fish ponds as part of a vision of food self-sufficiency. Keava Nui is the only functioning in local uh, um, on Molokai, spanning 60 acres, Keavanui cannot be conceived of as one thing. It is as much a political and cultural project as it is a place. This piece is not an invitation to visit Keavanui, but rather an invitation to glimpse possible futures that are opened when we look at the case of Keavanui to pay attention, to pay close attention to Owidi relationships between Kanaka and the structures on the land that make it Aina. The piece is designed to reflect the intimate links and co-constitutive relationships between Aina and Kanaka, guiding the re reader through different parts of the local ia and juxtaposing those places with the kia'i local, the caretakers who exhibit similar functions. Hanohano, Naehu's knowledge about the three pono are necessary, are necessary elements for a structurally restored local ia the kuapa, the wall, the makaha, the gate, 
and the Vai or fresh water source. Each element provides a metaphor for the three Kia'i local and their stories about coming to the restoration project. This re-narration of the work of restoration then also shows that the fourth element that makes Hawaiian fish ponds functional are Kanaka themselves. Ultimately, their essay argues that respectful visitation means engaging in reciprocal relationships with indigenous peoples and the structures and resources that give them life. Visitors to Hawaii cannot know places without developing relationships with Kanaka who reside upon and or work with these aina. The braided essay leaves readers with a basic understanding of this local ia, its structure and significance in a time of climate change and food insecurity, as well as a deeper appreciation for the kinds of relationships that can be developed within indigenous futurities. Part three, Huakai, chores and itineraries, uh, feature actual tours and practice that address geographic, environmental, social and political issues on the islands, um, transformative practices of journeying that have been revived or imaginative itineraries that unsettled tourism mobilities. So Ahuakai, uh, we wanna point out, is not an empty itinerary, but rather a journey defined by intention. So this purposefulness is crucial, it is demanding. The Ahuakai that are offered in this section have very precise aims of moving people through a place and providing new ways of looking at and interacting with some of the history, struggles, and relationships that shape Hawaii. It demands that you journey with deliberation and an openness to being disquieted by what you might learn about the place and yourself. It will place you in relationships to people and to the land that you might not expect and which will demand something of you, a shift in perspective, an injunction to take action, a challenge to get involved. So Kyle Kajihiro and Auntie Terry Kekoolani created the original detour in Hawaii. They have given us their blessing to, they gave us their blessing to use the term for the title of this book. Kyle and Auntie Terry's activist work as advocates of demilitarization led them create, to create the demilitarization tours, which exposed the US military's social and environmental impacts in Hawaii. It unsettled its claims to Hawaiian land and revitalized Hawaiian place names and stories and also finally lend support to Kanaka Maui resistance and resurgence initiatives. So their Huaka'i traces one of their standard routes, which includes four main sites. The Iolani Palace, Halava at Camp Smith, the Pearl Harbor War Memorial, and Hanakehau Farm in Waiava. At the Iolani Palace, they examine the Hawaiian Kingdom, the economic, geopolitical, and ideological factors driving the U.S.-backed overthrow of the monarchy and the prolonged military occupation of Hawaii. The palace provides a setting for telling stories of continuous Hawaiian resistance to annexation and the contemporary use of the palace as a gathering place and symbol of the Hawaiian independence movement. At Camp Smith, Kyle and Auntie Terry's detour moves on from Iolani Palace Auntie, um, uh, Kyle and Auntie Terry's detour moves on to Camp Smith, the headquarters of the U.S. Pacific Command, where they discuss how Keavalo Ke, Ke o Pu'uloa, also known as Pearl Harbor, was crucial to U.S. imperial expansion across the Pacific. Standing at the head of the monstrous military octopus, they narrate the various manifestations of militarization and its impact in Hawaii and the Pacific region. From there, at, they go down the hill and arrive at Pearl Harbor Memorial. There, they recall Hawaiian place names and stories and critically interrogate the discourse of innocence and security that legitimizes the na and naturalizes the U.S. presence in Hawaii. And finally, at Hanakehau Farm, the tourist participants learn about an initiative to restore Hawaiian cultural knowledge and land use practices in the shadow of the ruined environment of Pearl Harbor. This Huaka'i narration concludes with thoughts about consequences of military policies that implicate Hawaii in America's war against peoples in distant lands and our responsibilities to address both the impacts of militarization locally and abroad. 
Part four, Beyond the Big Eight, offers new mappings of Hawaii that disrupt the notion that Hawaii is geographically bounded by the eight main islands. So while this guidebook thus far has focused on the importance of place and particularly of Hawaii as Aina, um, it is just as important to understand the boundaries of, of Hawaii stretch to all the places where Kanaka Uibi visit, live, dwell, and die. In other words, while the islands are crucial to Hawaiian sovereignty and identity, they are a pico, an umbilical cord that connects, that connects Kanaka Uibi to their collective ancestral homelands and not a measure of authenticity or a boundary. Hawaiians have always voyaged by choice beyond the shores of the islands. As David Chang notes in his contribution, Kanaka Uibi have a long tradition of voyaging and have themselves been part of explorations and migrations that have crisscrossed the Pacific and beyond. Challenging the notion that natives stay and others go, Chang's historical mapping of the routes that Hawaiians have long traveled is an important corrective to assumptions that indigenous people are fixed both in place and time. He asks, quote, as indigenous people of one land who are living on the lands of other indigenous people, what is the kuleana of Oibi in diaspora? What are their obligations born of their genealogy and of their connections to place? What is the right way to act in such circumstances? For Kanaka in diaspora, the question is a real one." Unquote. These questions are very real for the non-Kanaka visitors who come to Hobai for, for vacation, as well as for those who migrate to, to these shores to live. So our book tries to pose to the reader, what is your kuleana and how will you carry it? At the same time, Hawaiians have been forced to move because of political, economic, and social conditions beyond their control, such as a prison industrial system that has systematically exported disproportionate numbers of Kanako Weebe to the arid lands of Turtle Island. In this new carcerial mapping, the strain of a discriminatory legal system disperses the family and the community and strains at the ties that bind us to homelands. This last question, this last section is crucial. Hawaiians do not stop being Hawaiian when they leave Hawaii and their familiar relations and their, famili mili oh, and their familial relationships and nor do their ethical obligations to each other and the Aina end. People who come to settle in Hawaii from elsewhere bring with them the memories of their lands even as they have been displaced. We are still Kanaka Aina, Kama Aina even when the land of other, even when on the land of other ancestors and lands feed us. In traveling elsewhere, we are also bound by decolonial ethics to restore and support the Ea of the lands and people wherever we may dwell. And this is for, you know, real for me as I live up here in the lands of the Ilaquangan people. For this section, we want to highlight the contribution of Linda Peruto, a teacher of ethnomathematics at UH Manoa, who was fortunate to take part in the educational worldwide voyage of the Hokulea, a canoe that traverses the world through the traditional non-instrument wayfinding. First built and launched in the 1970s, the Hokulea symbolized the revival of indigenous ocean exploration and navigation. More than that, however, its mission is also very much tied to the protection and proliferation of the values of the people of the Pacific. Narrating her particular legs of the journey, Furuto discusses the kinds of knowledge exchange, the, the kinds of knowledge exchanges with various global communities that she encounters during the voyages. A particularly insightful moment was when they returned to the United States, and it sheds lights on sheds light on the protocols that need to be that need to reemerge re for decolonialism to be instructive. So this is a, 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 a short section from um, Furuto's uh, piece. En route to Manahata, the crew members requested permission from the First Nations to enter their lands in Chesapeake Bay. As Hokulea approached from the distance, the original stewards gathered at the dock waiting for her arrival. Chief Billy Tayak of the Piscataway Nation and Chairman Francis Gray of the Piscataway Kanoi tribe gave the signal that allowed the PBS crew members to join them ashore and then extended an invitation to participate in a solemn ceremony. The Hawaii delegation entered with traditional gene genealogical chants, mele and hula, acknowledging respect for our Native American host. Kuo Kalepa Baibayan formally requested permission to enter the Piscataway land. 
and reflected on the mission of the Malama Honua Worldwide Voyage. To seal the ceremony, Chief Tayak resolutely expressed, you are the second vessel to enter this area in 400 years, and you are the first to ask for permission. It is our great hope that together we will be able to reverse some of the damage that was caused by the first vessel. So, unquote. So in many ways, this exchange marks the kind of principles and protocol that um, protocols that detours as a book wants to establish with its guide to decolonialism here in Hawaii. Permission, reciprocity, responsibility, and the way that we think it, that we think about it, and our contrib contributors think about it, these are portable values for wherever we travel or settle. And over the course of the projects coming together, what became clear is that the glue holding it together was not any kind of notion of authenticity, but rather a common commitment to decolonization and the restoration of AA. So um, our colleague, Kanako Uli scholar, Noilani Gudir Kaupua, interprets AI in this way. And this comes from her introduction to the edited collection, A Nation Rising. And it reads, AI can be seen as both a concept and a diverse set of practices. AI refers to political independence and is often translated as sovereignty. It also carries the meaning of life and breath among other things. AI is based on the experiences of people on the land, relationships forged through the process of remembering and caring for Vahipana storied places. Ea is an active state of being. Ea cannot be achieved or possessed. It requires constant action day after day, generation after generation. When we describe the end quote, when we describe the aim of this book as contributing to the decolonization of Hawaii, we want to be clear that we are committed to the return of Hawaiian lands to the Hawaiian people and the removal of the kinds of institutions such as the United States military and its government that occupy and abuse, abuse this place. To get there, a process of decolonization must work at all the levels that imperialism and settler colonialism also operate. This book works on the level of ideas and practices, reminding people, both Kanaka Oivi and Nana Oivi, that there was a time in the not so distant past that Kanaka Oivi, quote, were born into and lived in a universe which was entirely of our making, end quote. And that is from um, something that Linda Tuhibai Smith wrote years ago. Detour is an, is an attempt to narrate this universe into being. And we end our entire book with a very short, Conclusion, link, concluding section titled Aole Ikapo, The Story and Work is Not yes, Yet Finished. And that's where we wanted to end our formal presentation and now open it up for discussion. I think it's uh, worth noting, I think at this moment, this point that um, the Detours book has also inspired a new book series at Duke University Press, um, a new detours book series at the University of um, Duke University Press. And so we have um, editorial teams working on new um, detours um, from lots of different places around the world. So please do uh, put your questions and comments in the chat or the Q&A. There's a couple already. Um, um, and we'll try to answer the ones that really have to do with the book rather than broader topics. Um, so Melina has a question in there, Hoku. Will the book be available and promoted uh, by the Hawaii Tourism Agency and Industry to educate visitors and tourists, et cetera? How, where, if not, it needs to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, we agree. One of the visions that we like, it, um, visions we had was like, well, we, we yeah, like we, we just like, Kept thinking, oh my gosh, what would happen if it was like on the ABC shelf and they, you know, stopped selling um, James Michener's Hawaii and said started uh, selling detours. Oof, now that's a future I could get behind. Or those postcards from Stan, uh, Tamita and, um, and, and Karen Kosasa actually being available. Exactly. You know, we thought about what would it mean to have those circulating um, in real in real life. And the original, you know, originally we asked the press if this was too expensive in the long run. 
if we can have tear out postcards in the book, um, mm-hmm. we weren't able to do that. But um, in the early promotions for the book, we, we actually printed them out as postcards and gave them away as part of the, of the book promotion. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know if we can answer your question about uh, federal recognition specifically, but there is an essay in the book, um, Uwahikea Uwahike Maile's um, essay on Aole, right? Can kind of tell you <laughs> the, the, the general uh, uh, at- attitude or the general orientation of our contributors towards uh, federal recognition, right? Um, the, the sort of way in which he assembles all the testimony and all the refusals in, in that um, essay and then ties it to the Kuwait petitions, right? Another set of refusals um, kind of gives you a sense of how um, basically I would say all of the, all of the contributors in us included um, feel that that recognition is not ever really a path to truly getting um, sovereignty, right? Um, exactly uh, so let's see any I'm, I'm looking at the chat hoku do you want to uh look at the last um q a yes so christy um so you say that you've purchased the book and it's sitting on the bookshelf ready to be read yay um what are the core building blocks in terms of education for example most kanaka don't even know hawaii was overthrown right well that's one of the things that we i mean again one of the reasons why we moved from the guidebook genre, which really has its audience as the tourist, to a guide to decolonization, because we acknowledge and recognize that, you know, the kind of histories that are narrated in the in the book and this kind of um, critical history of Hawaii is not one that most people know about. And so this kind of book and the stories that are in the um, collection, are ones that are important for so many people, so many people in Hawaii, but then, you know, I've been on Turtle Island now, and then I was in the United States for four years before moving um, up to Canada. And even the public school educational system in, um, you know, in Utah still narrates Hawaii's admission into the 50th state as the end of colonization, right, which it isn't. Um, and there's no mention of Hawaiian sovereignty and independence movements or any of that history. So, um, you know, decolonization is, that is a done deal because of the, you know, plebiscite that led to statehood and all of that. So, yeah, this, this book has, um, can be read by many different people and have and really be um, insightful. I mean, I think one of the other, you know, I have this, I have this one undergrad that I worked with one summer who really wanted to know a lot more about local histories and what kinds of things folks were up to in terms of decolonization and place-based kind of work. And at that moment, I couldn't really fully answer her question. And she was sincere, right? She was, she really wanted to know more. Um, and so this, this book is, you know, the way that we put it together is a little bit of an answer to that. It's, it's, it's really meant to kind of showcase a very limited, right? And I wanna emphasize this is not at all an encyclopedic attempt at kind of putting together all these different kinds of stories about place or the work that is place-based, but it's, it's a start that hopefully gets folks to be able to develop the tools to know where to look and to make the connections with different kinds of organizations to know where to look um, if they truly wanna get involved. So that's the hope that it provides not just an archive of some of these, um, organizations and practices, but also a model for how to go about finding them. Um, I think Kathy is asking, agree it's important for many to read and relearn what we thought we knew. Just curious, would this book ever be displayed in the same section as the typical tourist guide books? Um, when I've seen, it is, I think in the, like if you were to, if a bookstore were to carry it, it would be in the travel guide section of the bookstore. So in that way, <laughs> yeah. I think it was when when uh, it first came out, I went to Barnes and Noble to see where it would go. And somebody had, they were sort of side by side, but like there was a way in which, like we want people to pick it up and think they're getting a, a guidebook that is what they were expecting and then be surprised, right? Like be 
um, engaged in a different way and maybe made to think about, well, what, what were the kinds of things I was expecting or um, about this type of book? Because the, the cover also, and I, unfortunately my copy is in the other room, um, the cover is also sort of a play on like the, the look of the guidebook. We worked with the designers um, who were amazing at Duke University Press to, to kind of riff off of that look, right? There's a certain way in which it looks, but you know, then the image that we have has like a rusty fence, uh, you know, you know, it's the, it's the, um, it's the wall, uh, the sort of boarded up wall that is down at uh, uh, Kaimana Beach, <laughs> right? Um, so we just kind of wanted to kind of play that off a bit. Exactly. So an anonymous attendee writes, what's the relationship between your book and Kyle Kajihiro's detours and anti-tourist travel group? Yeah, no, um, we have a great relationship with them. Um, I think as we said in the presentation, um, we, we asked permission and was given permission to use their detours, the name of their tour as the um, title for this book and now for the series. And um, Kyle and Auntie Terry were a part of the process. One of the things we didn't talk about today, but we have in other contexts is the development stage of producing this, this text. Um, it was a highly curated um, process. We had multiple writing sessions with our contributors and had many, many dialogues and conversations with them throughout the development portion of the um, development portion of the, the book. And so Kyle and Auntie Terry were part of all aspects of the development of, of, the, um, of the book. And as we said, um, gave us um, their permission to use the name of their tour. And the tour is featured in the book as well. Yeah. Um, let's see, are there any other questions here? Uh, we had a question about places on the, de on the detour that you recommend to start when it comes to decolonizing the food of Hawaii. I think we don't have anything specifically about food to the Hoku. We have an essay in there about oh, really? all. We have um, Kyle and Auntie Terry's essay end on a farm where, um, you know, the idea is to grow kalo instead of weaponry <laughs> um, right outside of the Pearl Harbor area. Um, but I don't, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but I don't think we have specifically anything that focuses on food. And I did think we, I think at some point earlier on, we did think about that, but um, nobody necessarily had anything um, specific about, about food. But mm -hmm. that would be a great, you know, I think somebody has said something about like a, a cookbook, a decolonial cookbook. And I think that would be a fantastic, uh, fantastic book um, to, to, to put together, to be a partner book to, to detours. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause I think I, I think Bernadette mentioned it, that this isn't, I mean, it's a pretty thick book. We have what 40 something chapters it's, and it isn't even close to being exhaustive. You know, it is, just scratching the surface of the kinds of work that's happening all across Hawaii and beyond, right? And what we really want um, to do with it was to inspire others to look for projects like the ones in the book and contribute to them, expand them, donate to them, you know, support them. Um, work in your own communities to do decolonial work to restore AI, you know, and that's, and so it's just, yeah, it's intended to inspire yeah. others. Um, somebody uh, anonymous said, is another volume of detours in the works? Uh, we, we do have um, other volumes, like Hoku mentioned, in development for other sites, uh, Guahan, um, Palestine, Puerto Rico, Okinawa are among the others on the list. We are not the ones who are editing those because those mm -hmm. are not places we um, know particularly well. So we have editorial teams that have been assembled and we work closely with them to kind of talk about um, the kinds of- I think of, we have Singapore too. We have Singapore and yeah, um, and possibly the Yucatan right now. And so and then I'm trying to get Hoku to, you know, now that she's over in British Columbia, 
to Coast to Salish make, area. organize something there. Um, but I also think about actually like what would we do differently um, since Hawaii mm-hmm. was the first one um, and um, who, um, if not us, and I don't know that it should be us to would, would we'll do it again. Of a, of a, of a Detours Hawaii, you know, 20 years from now, um, you know, the, 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 re- the revised version. Um, and so I have, I have fun thinking about that and hope that it would be one of our, it would be our students, right? It would be people that we would know or perhaps even folks in the community because um, I think that that would be really special. Mm-hmm. Keahi asks if the book is at Namea Hawaii. Um, I feel like it was at Namea Hawaii. I'm pretty sure it was. Um, it's definitely at the UH bookstore. Um, and you can get it directly from Duke University Press. Um, Hoku put the link in the chat. It's the last thing on the chat. Um, so you can get it direct from, from them um, rather than ordering it through Amazon. <laughs> Thanks, Hoku. Um, um, but I, there should be local bookstores that have it. I'm pretty sure um, uh, Dush, is, what is that local bookstore just down the street? Is it Dush Shop um, in, in Kaimuki? Uh, should have it. We had an event with them. So it's, it's definitely at Mamea and definitely at <clears throat> Okay, great. Thank you. I, I don't know that there are any other questions. So basically, Bookstore, I think, has them, um, Melina, um, because uh, we, gosh, did we do it? We were supposed to do an event. Um, you know, a lot of the promotion um, in 2019, going into early 2020, got canceled because of COVID. And so, you know, the the moment that this book came out, um, we actually didn't have to deal with tourists <laughs> for a while. So it's sort of ironic, but now that, you know, we're seeing it kind of coming back, um, there's definitely some interesting things to be said about the responsibility of tourists traveling to Hawaii um, during pandemic, right, in pandemic times. And so, yes, yep. thank you. Okay, I'd be really surprised if it wasn't at Barnes and Noble as well. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, um, it's it's more any book the has more Hawaii, mainstream of the books. <laughs> any book has Hawaii on the cover, they they stock. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> and it it is. We should note that um, because of a Hawaii Council for Humanities grant, we were able to get a copy at least one copy of Detours in every single um, Hawaii State Library branch. So you should be able to get it um, through your library as well. Any other questions? If not, we can sign off. It was, it's really late for Hoku. It is late for me. <laughs> so, so she's more than happy to go. Um, I know, like, <laughs> ready for bed. Thank you so much, folks, for coming. Uh, we appreciate that you shared your Monday night with us. And um, go have dinner now, please. Well, I think we, we can bring it to a close. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting discussion and uh, um, of a really interesting book and concept. And obviously, it's going to go far um, in many other places. So thank you very much. Um, attendees, you can um, you can hear this again or have, uh, if your HANA or, or network missed it, on the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series YouTube channel. Mm. There will be a, 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 an edited version and edited the highlights that will be on our website for at least a year. So there are a lot of different ways to, to secure this. It's also been live stream to Facebook and YouTube today. So it's very much available. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha.